In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the first Friday of the month of May. There is all night adoration, and uh, all of you are most um, encouraged to come to adore Jesus Christ, the King, who dwells here in the tabernacle, who waits for the visits from his friends. Our Lord promised a great reward for those who do the corporal work of mercy of visiting the imprisoned. And he stays a prisoner in the tabernacle, as St. Peter Julian Amar says, he is a, always a prisoner. And he waits for anyone to come visit him, to console him, 
to make reparation to him to love Jesus Christ the King. So come and adore him tonight. So make some time in this uh, all night adoration. A time when our Lord Jesus Christ is so insulted, so offended, so blasphemed against by so many souls. So let's be eager to make reparation to the heart of Jesus. Why the heart of Jesus? Why the Sacred Heart? Why did God take on a human heart? From all eternity, did the, did the Blessed Trinity have a heart? Did the Son from all eternity have a Sacred Heart? The answer is no. God never had flesh. He never had hands. He never had feet. And the purpose He took on a human heart was for us. For our redemption, for our salvation, and for every man that lives on earth, we have a short time on this earth to give our heart totally to Christ, totally to God, because He took on a heart and gave Himself totally to us. And when did our Lord first take on the human heart? When did it happen? It was at the Annunciation, when the Angel St. Gabriel spoke to the Virgin Mary on March the 25th. And the moment the Virgin Mary said, Be it done unto me according to thy word, at that moment the incarnation, the greatest miracle, one of the greatest miracles took place. The second person of the Blessed Trinity came down in her womb and assumed the human nature. And at that moment, in, in germination was his little heart. And as the child Jesus grew in the womb of the Virgin Mary, by the power of the Holy Ghost, that little heart beat it more and more. And there was a time in the later months when the Virgin Mary could feel the heart of Jesus beating. And so this was the first time God took on flesh, the first time he took on a human heart. And it was for us, for our salvation, for our redemption. And then the human heart of Jesus was born in the womb of the Virgin Mary on Christmas Day, and that heart of Jesus grew. And every action of our Lord Jesus Christ was the action of God. Every sigh, every prayer, every nail he hammered as a boy with St. Joseph in the workshop, every time he swept the floor in the kitchen helping to clean, every time he did dishes, Every time he chanted with the St. Joseph and the Virgin Mary, and every time they, every year they went to the temple to pray, and as the child Jesus grew, his heart grew, and the love of God grew, because that love of, of the eternal God is expressed in, in the heart of Jesus. That's why he took on a visible heart, glowing with fire and bleeding bleeding for the salvation of souls. He really thirsts for souls. He thirsts for souls. And that's when he cried out on the cross. At last his hour came. After 30 years teaching us the secret of sanctity is in the sanctification of our daily duties. It really is. To undertake them heroically out of love for God. To offer up every cross, every joy, Every meal, every rest we take, every time of study, homework, dishes, changing diapers, hammering nails, shoveling dirt, cutting the grass, everything. Our Lord, when there's something on fire, the fire consumes everything in the fireplace or in the stove. So the heart of Jesus wants to burn everything in us. So that we offer everything we do out of love for God. This is really the message, one of the great messages of Fatima. Of the, to, when the angel spoke to the children of Fatima, he said to the children, Why are you playing? Why are you playing? Pray, he said. Don't you know God has big designs for you? And these little children, when they saw hell, they understood how serious the redemption is. They understood how... Our souls really are falling to hell. And souls are not vapors in the air. 
There are people you see that you live with that we that we knock elbows with in the uh, in this in the shopping stores, in our in our workplaces, and in public realms. These are souls, people, real people who Christ died for, who are falling into hell. And Our Lady complained at Fatima that many go to hell because no one offers sacrifices and no one prays for them. And this is this is what we're supposed to do. This is one of our great missions, and for, for little children as well, to offer everything out of love for God. Every time you fall and get wounded, you scratch, you break your leg, you get cut. Don't make a big show. Offer it to God out of love for Him. Offer the suffering for Him. So this is the secret of Fatima, one of the secrets. The third secret has yet to be revealed fully. But this is one of the secrets of sanctity that the Virgin Mary wanted us to embrace. So the heart of Jesus, He sent it Himself right before He instituted the sacrifice of the Mass with desire. I have desired to eat this Pass with what desire is this? It's the desire of God, the eternal God. That means from all eternity, from all eternity, and this is not poetry, this is not sentimental talk, this is reality. What God creates, He has known from all eternity, says St. Thomas Aquinas, and He has loved from all eternity. So each one of you here, God has known your name. He has known your birth date. He has known your favorite ice cream. He has known how you're going to live and, how you, and where you're going to die and how you're going to die. He knows the details. And that means what he creates, he's known from all eternity. And what he created, especially those of the human race and the angels, he has loved from all eternity. So it's a fact of theology, very real. To say that God from all eternity has thought of you by name. You've always been in the heart of God and in the mind of God. And that's why when he sees a soul run from him and live in mortal sin and worse, live and throw their souls to hell willingly, it literally breaks his heart. And that's why he says in the Psalms, my heart, Psalm 21, my heart has become like wax melting in my chest. Because St. Thomas Aquinas says, love makes the heart liquid. When you love someone, you, you want to help them, you want them to get to heaven, you, you pray for them, you, you hate to see them suffer, you hate to see them in misfortune. And when you love someone, it's like your heart is liquid for them. You would, you would gladly suffer for them, you would gladly endure even death. For their sake. And so Christ did this for, for all of us. And that his heart was like liquid and literally poured out on the cross when his heart was pierced open and crushed, crushed in the agony of the garden, humiliated in the scourging, crowned with thorns, carrying the cross like a like a soldier, like a champion, like an athlete carrying the trophy of the cross for our redemption to crush the devil. And so on the cross was Christ's great victory. And he literally poured out all of his blood, all of his fluids in his heart, the water. He poured it all out for the human race. And every Mass, this mystery becomes reality. In every single Mass, we're before Jesus crucified. In every Mass, when the priest says St. Leo the Great, when he says the twofold words of consecration, it's like the two times Moses struck the rock in the desert. When he struck the rock twice, the water gushed out from the rock and fed and was able to give drink to all the people and all the animals and it followed them, the rock followed them, says the Holy Ghost. So this prefigures the heart of Jesus struck on the rock. So he's the rock, of Christ. Christ is the rock, says St. Paul. This rock, this cornerstone that was rejected by the Jews and has become the head of the corner. This rock is Jesus Christ. And he's struck on the cross when the priest says the twofold words of consecration. 
It is like Moses striking that rock and the heart of Jesus gushes forth all his infinite love, all his graces. That's why he says, to those who thirst, come to me and I'll give you to drink. And this is, this is the problem with modern man. This is the problem with many souls. We're so filled. We're so already content. We're already content with the mud puddles of the world. Why do you seek after vanity, says Christ? He says, come to me and I will give you to drink. His water is pure. His, the sweetness of his wine, of his grace, and of his precious blood that you drink in Holy Communion, and uh, inflames your whole soul. This is what we are to drink. This is what we must be thirsty for. And that's why the Virgin Mary, she really portrays to us, Blessed are the poor in spirit, and theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who are the poor in spirit? The first poorest of the poor is the Virgin Mary. She who had no sin, she had no venial sin, she didn't ever even have an imperfection, but she knew I am nothing before God. My soul magnifies the Lord. Because she became the perfect diamond to reflect the full brilliance, the full light, the full color of the redemption. She was the perfect instrument. While we men, full of pride, full of our sins, full of our weaknesses, how often we're so foolish and we think we're full. We don't need to pray. We don't need to go to go to the sacred heart of Jesus to beg for grace. Woe to the rich, for they already have the reward, Christ says. Woe to the rich, that is, those who are filled with anything in their heart other than the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ. And so this is what we must always beg for and pray for, and humble our heart before God like beggars, that we really thirst, to ask that grace to thirst, for the love of the, the love of the sacred heart of Jesus. St. Augustine says in Psalm 24, he says that the deer, the deer, as the deer runs after the fountains of water, so my soul thirsts for thee, O Lord. And he says, how do the deer get so thirsty for water? When a deer sees a snake, says St. Augustine, in the road, the deer will uh, trample him. He will jump up and trample the snake. And battling that snake and crushing him, after uh, a while he gets thirsty. And he runs to the, ru the, he runs to the running waters to drink. And so St. Augustine says, when we battle the devil on this earth, that serpent, we must uh, go to those waters to drink. We must thirst for the... The, the waters of our Lord Jesus Christ, of His grace, from His sacred heart. And this is what we drink when we pray. This is what we drink when we contemplate our Lord. And especially this is what we drink when we receive Holy Communion. And so we should love the Mass, love the heart of Jesus. And this is what He wants from all of us. <coughs> and especially His seminarians and His priests. He wants that closeness, a greater love than between a husband and wife. He wants that with us, each one of us. And uh, that's what we must all pray for. And all baptized souls, not just those consecrated to God, but especially those consecrated to God, are preparing for their consecration to God. So what happens? The heart of Jesus dies on the cross. He is buried in the tomb. His soul goes to the limbo of the fathers, and he preaches to the living limbo of the fathers, and they fall down in adoration before him. St. Joseph is there, and all the patriarchs and all the saints, millions and millions of saints of the Old Testament. And then our Lord Jesus Christ goes to, in these, the last 40 days before his ascension, he visits the apostles, visits especially his blessed mother, he gives them instructions on baptism and the seven sacraments, and how the holy oils, especially like for example, holy oil uh, from the olive. The olive oil is something that is instituted by Christ. And it's always been respected by the Catholic Church for centuries and centuries until Vatican II. And in the new Code of Canon Law in 1983, signed by Pope John Paul II, they can allow any other oil, olive oil, Crisco, 
uh, palm oil, and that puts those sacraments at least to be doubtful. Because it was always understood you don't touch the matter of the sacraments laid down by Christ. And Vatican II, these men of Vatican, these thieves, these hijackers, these modernists, had the boldness to overthrow the Catholic Mass, had the boldness to overthrow and uncrown Jesus Christ the King, had the boldness to overthrow the rights of the seven sacraments that Christ instituted. And this calls down the anger of God. And that's why we're suffering this, this desolation, this desert that has over, overtaken the whole earth. St. Jerome says the whole earth has become dry and parched because the grace of God no longer flows through that new Mass. And as Archbishop of Fez said, the popes of Vatican II and the bishops no longer give the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. They no longer give His grace because they turn their back on tradition and on the great seven sacraments, especially the Catholic Mass and the doctrine on which the faith is built. So that's why Archbishop Lefebvre stood to defend the faith, and that must be our stand. We're not about persons, we're not about following persons, or even bishops. If they don't hold the faith, what do we do? We wait for God to give us a good pope, and he will. It's his church. And we wait for God to give us a good bishop who will stand to the line of Archbishop Lefebvre, because the four that he consecrated, all four of them, have in some way departed and failed in their mission. So do pray for them. Pray for all the priests. But the heart of Jesus, where did he, he stay? That heart stayed cold, cut open in the tomb for three days. And on Easter morning, he, that heart was miraculously cured. But he kept the scar. And that heart became warm again filled with the life of the soul, the divine soul of Jesus Christ the King, came into his body and warmed it up again. The blood started to flow again, the heart, he started to breathe, and the, he miraculously passed through the cloth, leaving us the miraculous image of the shroud and his face on the veil of Monopello in kept in Italy. And Jesus Christ rose, and so during the time of his resurrection to the ascension, he was coming to his apostles and the Virgin Mary. And yesterday was the great feast of the ascension, and the heart of Jesus ascended into heaven. He is the cornerstone, and he is laid in the heavenly Jerusalem. The earthly Jerusalem is destroyed, says St. Augustine. It's over. The Jewish religion is finished. It's done. The ceremonies of the Jewish religion are over. That's why it's a mortal sin for any Catholic such as Cardinal or Bishop Borgoglio, when he, no, when he uh, participates in these Jewish ceremonies, or Pope Benedict XVI, lighting candles with Hanukkah, these are serious blasphemies against our Lord Jesus Christ. Or when the American Council National Conference of Bishops proclaim that the Old Covenant is still valid, these are blasphemies against the redemption. The very serious blasphemies against God. So, Jesus Christ, the new Jerusalem is above, and as Psalm 21 says, the heavenly city is being built, Jerusalem is being built now by God the Father. The cornerstone is Jesus Christ, he is laid in heaven, and all the stones that are being chiseled on this earth are the saints. And God chisels us in this life, and he polishes gently sometimes, but sometimes he hits hard. Sometimes he has to knock the rough edges because we're all twisted, we're all abnormal, we're all deformed, we're all, uh, as the, as the colleagues of the Mass say during Lent, we're perverse, we're bent on evil. So we need the chiseling of the Holy Ghost <coughs> to chisel us, in the, to form us according to the image of the Blessed Trinity. And this is why God gives us crosses. But he's preparing us to be living stones in the heavenly city. And this will be the wedding feast on the last day. So the angels at ascension, they say, why do you stand here all day looking up to heaven? Don't you know he will come with the same glory and majesty at his second coming? 
And there Christ will come for the great wedding feast. In the wedding, the bride of Christ is the Catholic Church. That is, all those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and who died in the state of grace. All those saints will be the bride on that wedding day. And all the damned who refused the commandments, refused the love of the heart of Jesus, refused his state of grace, and to live in the state of grace and to be sorry for their sins, they will throw themselves to hell with the devil. And on that wedding feast will take place forever, as Christ says, the kingdom of heaven is like to a wedding feast, where the happiness and the tears are wiped away, and there is only joy known to the saints. And uh, the, all, the, all the joys that come with the beatific vision and the resurrected body, the uh, four qualities of the resurrected body that Christ showed that we will have, hopefully. So let's turn to the Mother of God. We have the three hearts in heaven. The heart of Jesus, the heart of Mary, and the heart of St. Joseph. And those three hearts love each soul. So let's really consecrate our, ourselves to the heart of Jesus and Mary and St. Joseph. And on, the, on the May 31st, this month, the seminarians, on that feast of Our Lady as Queen, uh, the seminarians, some of them will renew their consecration to the United Heart of Mary. Some of them will make their consecration for the first time to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So they're preparing this month for that great event of surrendering their whole selves to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so if any of you want to join in that ceremony, you can prepare now, especially you young kids, you children. Um, May 31st will be the day of the consecration. And the tabernacle will be open, and they will pray that long prayer of St. Louis de Montfort to give themselves totally to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And under her protection, we will grow in the love of God. We will conquer sin and temptation. We will obtain heaven. Because no one turns to the Virgin Mary and is ever turned away. So let's ask is this great love of God, the great desire to see the face of God in this Holy Mass. O oh, Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you. 
Christ.
Dominus Thank you. 